first from Killian. He says, Ben and Andrew, Ben's optimism about the hypothetical IO device was refreshing. While I agree that advertising is the most obvious way to, mon to monetize ChatGPT at scale, I've been a bit disappointed by how often Ben has framed this as the best or only way forward. Framing ads as the natural endpoint of OpenAI's arc feels like thinking from the last generation of tech, not the one we're entering now. The more interesting question is, how can OpenAI monetize its best users in a way that's aligned with what this new technology actually enables? I've been just, pretty disappointed. Just, just, to, just to jump in on this, the, the problem is the best users are the ones that uh, are most likely to explore and find alternatives. Like, and the, the I just want to push back on advertiser critiques generally because I think they come from a place of people like you and I who can afford to buy as much stuff as we want, <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. Like, like the, the, the reality is, is number one, most people can't afford that. And number two, most people are unwilling to pay for, for things like this. Now, what that advertising looks like might be very different. I, I've, I've been writing about this marketplace for content. Well, there's an implication in that that is tied into people paying for good and better research. So uh, I personally don't want an AI with ads. Like, like, like the, the, so I, I recognize the sentiment here, but there's just a function of number one, you, you need scale. Uh, yeah. Number two, you have a lead. And number three, if you don't do it, someone else will do it. And there just is a large fraction of people in the world that are not going to pay or are unable well, to pay. Yeah, and correct me if I'm wrong, but part of your argument with OpenAI and advertising is that they're going to end up there eventually because they're trying to serve a billion people, and the sooner you start it, the better you'll be three years from now. And well, so you just get a sustainable advantage in the no long one. run because yeah. you, you, very few companies can actually make money from advertising. That's the other thing. Everyone sort of ends up advertising, but it's like Google and Facebook, right? <laughs> like I mean mm -hmm. everyone else is like is like marginal at the end. What that gives those two companies is this astronomical advantage in R&D and in capital in capital investment. If you if AI is all about capital investment and is all about R&D, then getting plugged into a scalable business where you simultaneously get to serve everyone and also you get to increase revenue per user without them feeling it. It's like it just the economic rationale is just really, really overwhelming. That that's yeah, that's the key. It's not it's not that I don't even know what this advertising is gonna look like. I recognize all the challenges and issues of like but how structurally get... speaking, you're gonna end up there eventually, regardless. Would be you're going to, and you have to, if you want to have a sustainable advantage in the long run. Like, like we're not in the, you know, it, it, again, yes, there are people that there's gonna be AI takeoff. The AI is gonna start building itself, then it's gonna be a material. I, I guess so. That that's certainly an alternative. But assuming it plays out with a lot of competitive labs where you have an anthropic you have a google you have an open ai it's it's a meaningful long-term sustainable advantage that if you don't take someone will like meta mm -hmm. ai is going to keep plugging away like they might be having talent issues now or management issues or or whatever it might be but th like it's going to exist out there if open ai doesn't take that opportunity you know someone else will Okay. Uh, well, Killian continues and says, I've been pretty disappointed with where tech has gone over the last 10 to 15 years. Desktops have not evolved. Mobile devices have largely turned into consumption machines. Most of the time, it feels like I get things done in spite of my devices, not because of them. With AI, I've become hopeful for a new direction. There's also an interesting economic angle here. This is a path to, quote, AI native deflation, end quote, as Daniel Gross put it. For example, I might end up paying $120 a month for an open AI subscription across IO and ChatGPT. But if that helps me improve my physical health, mental focus, and professional output, it's an easy trade. I'm substituting money on things like gyms, personal trainers, coaches, or apps I don't use. That's a massive surface area for value capture. So Ben, what do you think of the take from Killian there? Are you ready to go full optimist on the uh, IO future at OpenAI? Well, this makes me want to make sure we're doing sharp tech in 30 years 
so that we can hear from either Killian or Killian's kid when mm. they email us and they're like, you know, AI was sold to us as this big improvement, but actually it's <laughs> just made us, you know, more focused on consumption and entertainment, all these sorts of things. And uh, this new technology is going to make it so much better and we can uh, get rid of gyms and, and, and AIs that we pay for. I mean, like, like the, there, there's a, there's a very sort of backwards looking perspective to this that I think I mentioned in the context of trade, right? There's massive gains that have come that we all just ignore and don't really pay attention to because it's not mm -hmm. even in our, like, we can't even plausibly imagine an alternative. We can't even think about a world with no containers. It's just, We've it's been not living even... with shipping containers from the day we were born. Yeah, that's right. And, and, and I think there's a similar thing here. Like the, to say that, technology gets in your way and doesn't help you get stuff done. Is that actually true? <laughs> right? Like if you mm. actually went through and, and went through day by day and everything that you do, I don't believe you. Right. Unless, unless you're in some sort of, it is even as I say, some sort of like What's real world physical is, industry. As we talk it through in order for an AI forward device to eliminate a lot of the friction that people grumble about with their smartphones, you would have to kind of rework the modern workplace because everybody's on there sending emails, everybody's in group chats, slacks and stuff like that. I think the things people hate about their smartphones are probably here to stay regardless. I mean, I guess what a lot people, of people hate about their smartphones the is they hate themselves. Well. Yeah. You're, you're getting <laughs> well, given what you want, right? Like the, so your Killian mobile is device. Saying, Sam, Johnny, save me from myself. I, I can understand the argument and the sentiment there. Complete, completely agree. Number one, that's what he's saying. And number two, I completely understand the sentiment. <laughs> the, the, the whole problem is that, you know, TikTok's right there, right? You just have yeah. to touch a button. You don't have to actually watch TikTok. You can actually just use your phone for productive outcomes and now have access to a device that lets you achieve those productive outcomes in more places and in, in, in more use cases. And by the way, I bet you do do that a lot more than you realize if you actually, like, I think, did we do this? Did I ask you to document how many times you use Google in a day? I, I feel like oh, this yeah. was a very early show. I kept yet. a Google diary for a little while there and we didn't end up reading it on the show because it would have been me reading like 17 Google searches per day per day the, like the, no like it's like 17 per hour thing you could possibly imagine like restaurants things like that yeah exactly so uh and that was i think i was arguing that google is still like I, something i use constantly um but in any event right that... so we're on the same boat here and so I, I think there's this is just killian is is expressing frustration with to take this full circle, the lack of friction that smartphones enable because that lack of friction doesn't just enable more productive use cases. It also enables giving into our worst impulses, mm -hmm. right? Like, and, and it's, it's always going to be easier and more tempting to do the waste time, you know, get that quick dopamine hit sort, sort of bit. Like, so I actually share, I think broadly the sentiments Killian is expressing here but I think there's a over ascribing to they did the tech wrong when the reality is they gave the, us the tech that we wanted. And, and this mm. has been pulled out by us collectively. A, a, and Facebook is huge and valuable and TikTok is popular and all these sorts of things precisely because we want it and use it. And, you know, I think he, he I'm sure he strongly agrees with, with, with Johnny Ive, who, who's expressing and if anything, this is actually, I think, a critique I have of this effort in that Johnny feels so, like, disgusted and personally responsible for the phone <laughs> that I almost wonder if this device will end up compromised precisely because he's trying to avoid the phone downsides mm. when the reality is these are tools that achieve their upsides and downsides based on our personal choices and if you don't leave the latitude and freedom for these to do things that you think are bad you're also not going to leave the latitude and freedom to do things that are good and yeah. and, and it will be well, more constrained also, than it maybe should be otherwise 
And it's just hard for me to imagine a world where you don't need a smartphone. And maybe that's a, a me problem because I this isn't a shipping container situation. I've lived in a society where smartphones weren't ubiquitous and everybody got by just fine. But now there are so many times throughout the day where you're relying on text messages, you're relying on emails. Like I said, it's all baked into the workflow. I don't know what OpenAI could invent that's so revolutionary that it disrupts that workflow. Um, and so people well, are still going to need their, their phones. We're just talking about layering more technology on top of that. So I'm not sure it's as much of a panacea as Killian hopes it will be. Right. But I hope that I'm wrong. You know, it would be great if I'm wrong. And reading the email, it is kind of a light bulb moment for me where if I step back and consider like, where are we going to be by the time we get to 2035? I think there's probably a better chance that we left this mobile paradigm behind um, than there is that we just continued using smartphones and remaining as hopelessly addicted to it by the time we get to 2035 as we are today like it is quietly corrosive in ways that are frustrating to just about everybody who uses an iphone so something will change i don't know whether open ai will be the company that disrupts the way we use cell phones but i would guess that we're not going to be in the same place forever here well, you're such an optimist. I love it. It's a, it's a good good counterpoint. I think that there's it's very possible that we look back. And uh, again, I can't wait for Killian. Did we, just give your kid a podcast. Get him a mic now. Get him started. I can't wait to listen in a little bit. When mm. they're bemoaning the, you know, like what are the what are the big problems, quote unquote problems, compared to your and my like college experience is there weren't really camera phones when we were. I mean, uh, maybe there were for you. You're, you're, you know, you're what? Uh, there solid were millennial. Halfway through college. Yeah. The yeah. camera phones began. I got to my, I got my first cell phone, I think, my junior year of college. And there might have been a very grainy, like, single like photo. Really tape. There was bad no camera phones. <laughs> but, yeah. you know, there's a, the, one of the things people talk about is why do kids like party labs? Why do they do things XYZ? And, like, well, if you're at risk of everything being recorded all the time, it's on one hand of of course there's some bad things that don't happen and that that, that is good there's also this feeling of being eternally sur surveilled and mm -hmm. this panopticon and the fact that some of the most like some of the ai devices that are out there now like this pendant idea that records everything that you hear that sounds ho horrible to me <laughs> right like, yeah. like just to be super clear and this idea I'm be wearing like whatever this open AI device is uh, by definition, it's going to have a microphone and like picking all those sorts of things up and, and everything is now sort of in the matrix as it were and tracked like my part of my oh, whole thing, <laughs> part of my whole thesis about we're over indexing on online privacy issues is part of that take. And everyone forgets about this is my take is what we should be really focused on is offline privacy issues and the digitization of everything. And I'm like, computers naturally track everything. We spew data everywhere. It is what it is. Online should be its own world. What we have to be worried about is offline and taking the offline onto the internet. And, and, and that is happening and it's happening on steroids. And so there's a good chance we look back and say, yeah, well, at least with a camera phone, you had to pull it out of your pocket and press it. And today, see everything <laughs> yeah, is, oh it, 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 but what is stopping us from getting there? There's like no brakes on this train. Yeah. Well, uh, you just brought me back down. I was trying to <laughs> identify. You are, it with was Killian a great. It was sorry. You just let me talk into first. a brighter future <laughs> for us. God damn it. Uh, well, uh, continuing.